Hello, and welcome to our digital event series, Eureka, Lenda Meets California, where we have two special guests that will be discussing innovation and transfer in higher education. Eureka, Lenda Meets California is a series celebrating and fostering the sister state partnership between Baden-Württemberg and California. You can find further lectures and discussions within this series on our YouTube channel and website. Due to COVID putting the kibosh on in-person events, the DAI has moved its offerings online. If you're interested in the myriad events the DAI provides, sign up to become a member today. You can visit dai-heidelberg.de. It is with the support of our members that we're able to put on events such as Eureka, and we thank you for that support. This series is organized by the DAZ Stuttgart in cooperation with the German American Institute in Freiburg, Heidelberg, and Tübingen, with the generous support of the State Ministry of Bonn Württemberg. During this 90 minute event, we encourage you, the audience, to submit questions to our two guests in the live chat. We will reserve 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the event for a Q&A session. I'll be keeping an eye on the time and we'll let our guests know when we have five minutes left of the discussion hour before we move on to the Q&A session. My name is Lauren Watwood. I am your host and moderator for this evening. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Byers. Professor Byers has been teaching at Stanford University since 1995. He focuses on education regarding high growth, principled entrepreneurship, and responsible technology innovation. He is the first holder of the Entrepreneurship Professorship Endowed Chair at the School of Engineering and is also a Bass University Fellow in Undergraduate Education. He has been a faculty director since the inception of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, STVP which serves as the Entrepreneurship Center for the School of Engineering. His current activities at STVP include its Principled Entrepreneurial Action and Knowledge, PEAK, project, its Mayfield Fellows Work Study Program in Entrepreneurial Leadership, and the Stanford E. Corner Collection of Thought Leader videos and podcasts, of which there are many and very fascinating. I suggest you take a peek. He is a co-PI on the Hacking for Defense project sponsored by the Office of Naval Research to better connect entrepreneurship education with national security challenges. He was the director and PI of the Epicenter, funded by the National Science Foundation, to stimulate entrepreneurship education at all U.S. engineering, science, and colleges. He hosted 50 roundtables in entrepreneurship education on five continents over the course of 15 years. Where he has time to sleep during all this, I know not. Professor Byers is a lead author of the Technology Ventures from Idea to Enterprise textbook from McGraw-Hill in its fifth edition. Now, he's a Keohain, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, distinguished visiting professor at UNC Chapel Hill and Duke University. He has been a recipient of the prestigious Gordon Prize by the National Academy of Engineering and the USA and Stanford University's Gores Award, which is their highest honor for excellence in teaching. He is a member of the Board of Trustees at Menlo College and advisory boards at Harvard Business School and Conservation International. Tom Byers holds a BS in Industrial Engineering and Operations Research, an MBA from UC Berkeley, and earned his PhD in Business Administration at Berkeley. Welcome, Professor Tom Byers. Our <laughs> next guest, is Professor Dr. Matthias Weidemola. Matthias Weidemola is Chair Professor for Experimental Physics at the University of Heidelberg and the Director of Heidelberg Center for Quantum Dynamics after having studied physics, philosophy, and history in Bonn and Munich. He worked with Sergei Horoche, the Nobel Prize winner, 2012, at École Normale Supérieure in Paris and under the supervision of Theodore Double Hick. W. Hange, also a Nobel Prize winner, 2005, at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics near Munich. He received his PhD from the University of Munich, and as an EU Marie Curie Fellow, he went for two years to the University of Amsterdam 
and the FOM Institute for Atomic and Molecular Physics. Before he took a position as independent group leader of the laser cooling group at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics here in Heidelberg. In 2003, he was appointed chair professor for experimental physics at the University of Freiburg, where he stayed until 2008, before moving back to Heidelberg, where we have him now. Since 2013, he is also directing a laboratory in Shanghai as a professor at the University of Science and Technology of China in the framework of the 1,000 Talent Plan of Chinese government. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, was chairman of the Division of Atoms, Molecules, Quantum Optics, and Plasma in the German Physical Society, and served as dean at the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Again, where these men have time to sleep during all this, I know not. He is engaged in the education of physics teachers and the dissemination of science to the general public, much like he's doing this evening with us. His scientific interests address fundamental questions of modern quantum physics on different levels of complexity, using modern methods of quantum control and quantum engineering. Welcome, Professor Matthias Wiedemola. Thank you both for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. And without you. further ado, let's dive into the first question. To open up, I'd like to ask you, do you think universities have shaken the image of the ivory tower? Well, first of all, I'll defer to my good new friend, <laughs> the, the no, good but professor I wanted to invite, of physics. I want to invite is, our foreign speaker here, <laughs> our foreign guest. <laughs> well, well, I'll take a stab at it, Professor. I mean, but first of all, with that kind of introduction, I, I'm happy to give you the whole hour because I just want to hear what you're working on. I thought that we talked as, about innovation. <laughs> I know. Well, it, it, just as an enthusiast of, of science and, and physics, it, it, my goodness, it is a true honor to be involved. And may I just also say thank you for that kind introduction, introduction Lauren, um, and this opportunity to participate today. It came about, by the way, by uh, Stanford University's director of the campus in Berlin, which has been there uh, for over 50 years. I mean, Stanford's had a campus in that city for, I believe, 50 years. I've taught in our campus in Florence, and, and I was telling y'all uh, a little bit ago that I'll be back next year to be in Florence, but I certainly would love to come up and visit the area. But thank you to uh, our director in, Flor uh, in the Berlin campus for Stanford, Karen Kramer, for, for making this connection and, and giving me this opportunity to, to be with a, such an esteemed guest. Uh, so back to the Ivory Tower. You know, that, that's a fun term, but you know, we're at a serious time in civilization, <laughs> all kidding aside, and I do like to, to, uh, to have fun in these kinds of things, because otherwise, if I think too much about the challenges faced in the world, you know, I'll just want to cry. Uh, but the, there is an abundance of, and as an entrepreneur at heart and an entrepreneurship teacher, I see the, here's our motto at, at Stanford in my unit. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. And the planet and society have huge problems. So if there ever was time for the Ivor Tower to contribute, which it has, you know, the history shown, it really has. That's a, that's a sort of a false dichotomy uh, it label, I believe. But who cares about history right now? The time is now. And I think we are all very uh, keenly, keenly aware, acutely aware, and keenly aware that something uh, in all sorts of grand challenges has to be addressed. And it's going to take universities, it's going to take industry or business, and it's going to take government to help solve these challenges. And you know, you just you can name them off. You know, whether it's climate, whether uh, it's pandemic, it's wh whatever. You know, if, if anything, the last year taught us is the time is now. So how about that for an opening? It's great because I love what you said. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity, because that's something I always have to explain to people. For a physicist, the, 
the, this, this term problem is positive. Yeah? Usually people consider a problem something negative. But when we discuss things, we always say, this is a great problem. So we love to solve problems. And uh, concerning this term of ivory tower, of course, I mean, this term, I don't know where it comes from, uh, this top was. I always feel suffocated when I hear this ivory tower. I, I already, when I was younger, I felt somehow like being squeezed into something. I never actually figured out where this term came from. What I have to say, what I love about this idea of being in this kind of, um, let's call it a protected tower is, uh, and that is something that we should consider really a positive, uh, uh, a positive property of the universities, is if you sit in this protected environment, it gives you time to think about difficult problems and to find good solutions to very complex situations. And that's something that we need today much more than we need it ever. So if you want to find a solution to something that's really important, it requires more than just giving an answer that can fit into a, let's say, Twitter, a uh, small Twitter chat. You need something that really, really takes many, many perspectives into account. So in this sense, uh, one could even say it's positive to have this kind of protected, uh, protected uh, area. At the same time, of course, we have to go out uh, eventually. But I've never, in, uh, me personally, I've never seen a university as something that is somehow closed or something that is not uh, interacting with its surroundings. It, for me, it's more like an, an, a vivid organism uh, where you go around and just go around a campus. You meet people wherever you would talk. You find interesting discussions. There's lots of new ideas. In particular, there's wonderful young people uh, that have great uh, uh, visions, that have great ideas of what should, what's important, what's not important. So in this sense, I think uh, this topos of the ivory tower, actually, I, I never understood where it came from. Maybe historically one should figure out, but it's not how modern universities actually are, at least not the way uh, I can see them. Yeah, and what's fascinating is you and I, and, and I've just had the pleasure of getting to know you, getting ready for tonight. Um, you and I are part of, I guess, the acceleration um, of, uh, is, are we okay? All the, is the feed okay? But we could hear you, Oren. <laughs> we are still happy that you exist. <laughs> yeah, you just... Conversation, and I'll make sure I'm well, properly muted next time. <laughs> oh, wow, this, this got to be a humanities discussion really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> We got right out of the, you know, I was going to celebrate at some point Heidelberg's, uh, you know, amazing uh, connection of, high, you know, humanities and science, but I hope we get to that discussion because that's what I'm proud of, why I'm proud to be at Stanford and not necessarily, a, you know, Institute of Technology. But we'll get to that at some point because we do celebrate the humanities, but we just, you just did for us. <laughs> you do exist. <laughs> Therefore, you are. Uh, okay, so what, what I was... Uh, celebrating was that we have this chance to chat about how our universities, Heidelberg or Stanford, or you know the other one I know so well, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, how these universities are adapting to the 21st century and taking a uh, scientific approach, the scientific method into, uh, into the future, but also looking for, everything can always be better. How do we accelerate these advances into society, you know, to, to address these, that, that's the, I think all of us realize at the time that there's a sense of urgency like never before in history uh, that we have to deal with some things. And what we need is that energy. You know, I, I live in an area where Facebook is located, you know, the headquarters, where Apple, the, you know, the headquarters are, where Google, you know, I, I'm, I'm a 20 minute drive from every one of their headquarters. And so many of the people there, I have had the, uh, you know, managers and in some cases, the founders, I had the chance to teach the last 25 years. So these massively scaled enterprises um, are something to behold, right? I mean, you know, their, their, their valuations, their impact, all that sort of stuff. We need a similar kind of uh, situation to happen in the next 25 years to give uh, everybody's children or grandchildren a real shot at you know at a at a great life and i'm i'm an optimist i really believe it's there so it's i'm fascinated to watch how can we uh how can we 
for how can we, meaning Stanford and, and Heidelberg and, and the other great universities of the world, participate in this process? And I, and I firmly believe that what you're doing at Heidelberg with transfer policies and your tech, in other words, accelerating technology and science out of the lab into uh, society, into or whether it's business or otherwise, that's part of it. I have my own contribution, which is uh, I believe innovation and entrepreneurship can be taught. In other words, it can be learned. That's a better question. Can it be learned? Yes, it can. And we have evidence to that. And the universities around the world have really stepped up invest, investing in the teaching and, um, and learning of entrepreneurship and innovation. So I, you know, at some point I'd love to dive deep into that because that's what I know best. Yeah, there was, that's something I would like to, to hear from you because I mean, here in Heidelberg, if you want, as like you said, Heidelberg is, is one of these, it's, it's the oldest university in Germany. It's one of the comprehensive universities in terms of uh, really encompassing uh, humanities, uh, natural sciences, uh, medical school, you were two big medical schools actually. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, different uh, disciplines uh, living together here, working together here at a very, uh, let's say compressed space. At the same time, now, um, this idea of entrepreneurship, innovation, that was going on uh, a lot here in Heidelberg. It was a little bit under the radar screen because it was not putting, uh, it was not put at, as one of the major, let's say, uh, directions, missions of this university only until, let's say, the last couple of years that became also something that was politically much more uh, um, pushed forward. So you said you can learn these things. And I wonder, for a place like ours, is that the right approach? Uh, is that something we should do? Or isn't it better that we just do what we currently do quite successfully? And that, that is, we, we, we train people to become critical thinkers, to become very independent, to really know how to solve very complicated problems. And only after they have done that, actually to get them to get uh, bring this into, uh, into the society and, and make, uh, as you said, the world a better place. So should we do that right from the beginning? Uh, I would actually object at this level. Uh, or at which point is the right time to capture the, the young people and to make them become aware that there's something outside that's called the world? Well, let me, let me, let me think about that last uh, comment because I was jumping up and down inside my body here that what you said before is exactly the philosophy that I have. I do not think your job as, or mine, especially at, at, at top tier research universities like Heidelberg or Stanford or, or our peers around the world, your job is not to train founders of um, startup companies that want to do another application, you know, write a little application or you know, and I, I'm, I'm just trying to make, keep this light <laughs> with a little bit of humor, but, you know, real technology, real science, those kinds of, um, and it's okay if they're digital, if, if it has something to do with digital, but it, it's really heartening to hear, or, you know, makes me happy to hear that there isn't an obsession with, well, we need our, our, um, fill in the blank. I'm not trying to disparage anybody, but we need our Facebook. You know, we just need one breakaway digital tech company uh, to uh, to put us on the map. That because that that is like chase, that's like Don Quixote chasing windmills, and really the wrong way to measure your success as opposed to if, if you buy in that entrepreneurship and innovation can be learned, then the right thing to do is to put it, see it more like general education and take advantage of the fact that you have strengths and humanities, because frankly, I have a little secret for you. I'm an engineering professor in engineering background, but the root of innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, knowledge and skills and behaviors is in the humanities. It, it, it really, it, it's, a so, it's a social science kind of thing, uh, right up there with psychology and communication, uh, so sociology, it's, it's more drawing from that than some sort of algorithm. Now, 
where it does where, where it does connect with science scientific background is that what's become really popular in my field um, is this notion called lean startup. It's a term, lean startup. And Professor, all that me and Lauren, let, let me just make this real digestible to everybody listening. It, it lean startup as a method of innovation and entrepreneurship is the scientific method, but applied to business. So th there, there is the connection that has made it easy to justify, oh, well, let's teach every student just enough about innovation and entrepreneurship so they, they can believe that no matter what they do in life, which only a very few of them will start a company, and that's okay, but they will, they will start something it might be within a large enterprise it might be in education it might be in government i mean hopefully you know we'll have innovators in government um and that's that's where i see it more along the lines of our responsibility to include that in general education and the real the added benefit then is that the technology transfer operations that i don't run for stanford that's a completely different unit than you know me on the education side, but the technology transfer operations and th that staff uh, benefit that we have, we're putting out more, uh, think of it more like uh, we're, we're educating a workforce that's pre-processed to think like an innovator, to think like an entrepreneur, no matter what they do. But if th to think that way, combined with the great education they're getting from Heidelberg anyway in the humanities and sciences, then that makes them uh, more, it, it, make, it makes them ready to make a big impact and in, in, in do something great in their careers, which is, you know, will be the rest of this. I mean, it's pretty wild. They're likely to have careers if, if we don't let the world get away from us for the rest of the century. You know, if they live to 120, they're going to work till they're 100, which it will be 20, you know, 2200. You know, just think of an undergrad right now. They'll have an 80 year career. So do we want them to be an innovator and entrepreneur? Absolutely. And, and that's it's we have the evidence that that can happen. So it's, but, uh, it's, but again, it's come, not just tech should... transfer, but it's that. Yeah, go ahead. But what do you think is uh, is the right uh, time? So would you say would you say you should do this, let's say, in an accompanying way, having this uh, being part of the syllabus uh, all over the place, all of the time, or uh, or is it? I mean, I I'm tending to think, um, and this has to do, of course, with our good old academic traditions here. That first, it's a good idea to really learn something, uh, something really deep, let's say. To, to That's why you go to university. You go to university because you're interested in something, you want to know about it. It doesn't matter. In the best case, you don't even care about what, if, whether this is going to give you a job, but you want to be good at it and you want to really, you want to really do something in that. So uh, then at this point, I don't want to perturb uh, the people too much. Either they are already interested in becoming entrepreneurs, then they do it anyways. They program their apps and they do whatever they like. Uh, but uh, if they don't, I mean, fine. They just go and think of what is interesting here. Uh, what can I learn from this uh, archaeologist or what can I learn from this uh, quantum physicist here? Then there's, of course, a certain moment, um, and that's where I would say this, I would call the guys, uh, the young professionals. So that's the moment you're at the end of your thesis or you're writing up your thesis. That's the moment where you start to look around, okay, what can I do with what I learned? I tend to believe that this is a great moment to actually show an alternative uh, to the other possibilities that we offer, like academic mm -hmm. careers or traditional careers. In Germany, you have yeah. to see there's a huge... There's a huge background of these mid-sized companies here. Uh, we have all these uh, different ways to get higher education. So there is a large variety of opportunities that uh, students uh, from universities have. Sometimes situations are better, sometimes they're worse concerning unemployment and certain jobs. But nevertheless, the situation is still quite OK in many respects. So at this moment, anyways, is, is that the right moment to say, OK, now we are going to have programs that are really focusing on on these ideas of entrepreneurship and innovation, or would you still say that we need that uh, all over the place, all over the time, as as one of the uh, accompanying skills? Uh, well, I, I'm not one to ever want to be dogmatic about something. I, I hate, <laughs> one thing I've learned in 25 years at Stanford is 
making a course required is is a is a prescription for students to rebel. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I they just <laughs> yeah, they just they just don't like it. So That's we right. never That's have. Right. There is no required yeah. entrepreneurship course at Stanford. But what has happened is the demand has been high. I mean, students have asked for this. So it so as we crafted curriculum that would that was always uh, based on being an elective. In other words, there's no degree. Some some universities have chosen to have degrees in entrepreneurship, which I, I mean, in other words, a diploma, which I'm not a fan of. So I, I'm I'm more in the middle here, saying, I know let's certifying somebody and stamping them like a you know, with a tattoo e on their uh, forehead. That's that seems odd to me, or or being overly obsessed, like I said earlier, about looking for the next student founder in their, you know, spare time coming up with some application. I, you know, that I jokingly talked about. That's not. That's never been my intention or my colleagues. When I say my, I mean the the, the whole group of people at Stanford that have, over the last twenty years, tried to figure this out. Uh, so we've just created a lot of courses. And they're always they're always oversubscribed. So just to give you, let's just talk data here. So you, how how many students total at Heidelberg? Uh, Thirty thousand plus minus. Yeah, so it's more like a UC Berkeley. That's about the same size as is is my you know where I went to college. But Stanford is a, is about sixty percent of that total. You know, seven thousand undergraduates. You know, getting a bachelor degree and about 9,000 graduate students and maybe a couple of thousand postdocs. So 18,000 compared to the uh, 30 some odd thousand you're thinking of. All right, so it's pretty small and it wants to be a liberal arts school in addition to being so good at science and engineering. So it has a, it has a lot of ambition, just to, but just for those populations, we have, I'm gonna convert this. Are you on semesters or quarters? Semesters. Yeah, let me convert it. We're on the quarter system. So if I say there are, yeah, so that'd be the equivalent. Our 150 courses a year in innovation and entrepreneurship would be converted to 100. That's 100 courses, semester long courses. You know, some of them are seminars like this, you know, sort of talking heads like we're doing here, but others are very rigorous. And not all of them are about how to, you know, write a plan to start a business. Actually, very few. Um, most, most of them are about other functional matters or the mindset of an innovator or entrepreneur. And I'm including all the design. I'm, I'm including not just entrepreneurship, but also the design classes, you know, that better known as design thinking, that kind of stuff. All right, so I'm including that as well as how do you take a novel innovation and Take you know, take it forward into um, to, to 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 something else. You know, something more than just an idea or an, or a prototype. All right. So all that we're looking a hundred, a hundred, and you know what? We could offer two hundred equivalents, and they'd still be full. So some and these are not required. The students are making time to add this to their curriculum. So I believe in T-shaped people, not just because my name is Tom, but we have this. <laughs> We have this T-shaped model we like to use, which is what you were describing was go get really good at something, you know, like you did with physics or I did with uh, operations research, you know, uh, quantitative methods and, and uh, that kind of thing. That was my PhD. And so go deep. But this is more, I, I, I know I'm in dangerous territory by using the word general education because I'm not saying replace anything in general education. It's augment general education with these themes around uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And if we don't want to use those words anymore, just substitute the word creativity or the word leadership, you know, those kinds of uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And it's more in that, that uh, the T, the, the, the horizontal bar of the T-shaped person, go really be good at something in the process you're talking about. And I'm saying, and, this is augmenting the development of the whole person and the whole, the 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 professional, you know, to get ready to to go. And I, I'm always surprised that our first and second year students want 
a light, not a very heavy load, case, case load. They want some light courses like this one we're doing here, you know, where we're, I mean, this could be seen as a course that we're, we're talking about these themes. They want this exposure pretty early on in their first and second year. Um, because I don't know, I, and we can talk about why, uh, but they want that. And then as they get into going deep, either in their bachelor or their master's, then they want more about, well, okay, how, but how can I innovate? How can I get be part of something that will uh, be a leader in the category of whatever they do? And again, whether it's in business, government, or education themselves, that's what we're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, we, we just started these activities in a, let's say, in a, in a more uh, organized fashion. I can, I mean, I can, it's the same. I mean, we do these uh, startup labs, startup classes, uh, and they are, uh, they are very, very well received. And uh, also what we also don't do is making recommendations here when you should take them or it's, it's, it's an, it's an add-on. It's an, it's a, it's something that we offer. And if uh, you're interested, you do it. If you don't uh, also great. Uh, I think that's the right well, way to do it. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's giving examples, uh, making offers. Uh, that's what also universities are about, right? Yeah, but the, part of the problem for us in our, our Achilles heel, if that translates well, you know, our, 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 uh, our, Achilles our challenge. Heel. Yeah, Achilles heel, okay. The, 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 uh, are we having, you know, how, how we need to do assessment. And this is a very difficult thing to assess about, is somebody learning how to be an entrepreneur and innovator? It's just really hard to, to assess. I mean, I tell you what's not a good assessment. Hey, have you started a company yet? I mean, yes, that's the yes. worst kind of assessment because you do not want to send that signal. Um, I don't, and we've never emphasized that. Even though Stanford has produced all kinds of founders, and, but it's still a very small fraction of the graduates of the university. It's just that journalists love to write about that. You know, it, because it's it's just good copy for uh, whatever article is being or blog is being published. It is not the reality. It, it's always the big surprise when people come visit. They say, well, where are the founders? And I said, well, there are not a lot of them, you know, but they get all the attention. What we're more concerned about is, I like to say, we're spraying everybody with, um, with as possibly we can to get them ready, vaccinating them. Maybe that's the word. <laughs> vaccinating them with, uh, you know, never turning into being a bureaucrat, for example, you know, vaccination. I just made that up. That's, I'm going to use that vaccination uh, from being a bureaucrat and being more of an entrepreneur because, you know, I'm, I'm serious. Bureaucrats think about how much money they have and how many people they have in their control. And that defines their opportunity space. That is not, I'm sure the PhD students in your lab, that's not the way you want them to think. They would never make it a, another week in your lab if they came in and said, oh, professor, I, I you know, only have this much uh, talent available or this much money for my grant, and that's how I'm going to define where we're going to go with our experiments. I, I think you would probably scream, <laughs> as opposed to the innovators and our entrepreneurs who think, I'll figure that out later. I'm just trying to, you know, wh where's, the, where's, where's the problem? How can we experiment on solving it? And then we'll figure out where to get the money in the in the team later on, you know. Secondary, it's it's secondary to the pursuit of the opportunity itself, and and that's you know, the big secret. That's basically what we're teaching when we say innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. One of the things, as I said, I I, I mean, what we do have to do is give examples. I, I really love examples. I, I never know actually what to do with the term education. Uh, I have kids. Uh, I never we really actually knew what it meant to educate kids or to educate students. What we can give is examples. And what I love in, in such a space, we were talking about ivory tower, what I love about uh, this space that we have is uh, is that we can give lots of very different examples. There is, a, in the best sense, diversity that we have. Uh, at universities uh, where you can just take the examples that you like. And if entrepreneurship, uh, you have to give role models, you have to show these things, uh, you have to present it as examples, but it's uh, not something that you should, as you said, that you should everybody tell, you should administer this now, it should become a part of your points that you collect during your studies. 
May uh, Lauren, I don't want to take away the questions from you, but uh, there's one thing that is really that really that really I would like to discuss because it's something that I I, I try to find I, I try to figure out myself. Is that fine if I just do that? It's it's about the question of of what is the role of spaces, so physical spaces or or in, in any kind. Let me let me tell why I come up with this. I mean, I had we had this actually it was also DAI. Uh, it was an incentive that we had uh, writers here on campus discussing with us, mm -hmm. and and they got us into deep deep trouble because they were asking so difficult and so deep questions about uh, uh, things that I never thought of. And one of the questions they asked me was there was this writer from Italy. Uh, uh, she came into my office and you, she said, what is this room doing with you? So she was looking <laughs> around. How can you how can you be in that space? So I suddenly realized, I mean, maybe I was a little bit naive, but the architects, of course, know all about this. But of course, there is this 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 important effect that spaces have. And I wonder if you think about how to in, to encourage uh, creating new projects, creating, uh, as you said, startups, uh, uh, becoming entrepreneurs. What is the role of spaces, be it physical spaces, so places where people meet? Now there's a big, there's always this, uh, now there's these uh, joint workspaces, there's these kind of things uh, popping up. Uh, what kind of uh, environment, physical environment might also be just an environment in terms of uh, for providing possibilities and opportunities is actually needed to make people uh, feel free to follow their ideas on funding, founding companies, starting something, uh, messing it up again, uh, whatever. Is physical spaces, is that an issue or am I overestimating the role? Lauren, if you want to ever chime in, be our guest. <laughs> By opinion. all means, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, Matthias, you actually stole my next question from me. Oh. So you're oh, doing a fabulous you. job moderating. By all Terrible. means, please continue, <laughs> gentlemen. The question was, what strategies are you employing at universities? And this concept of space is something I had never considered in this rubric. So continue the conversation. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I have just have some observations and there and fr frankly, it may be more questions than not answers. So let's just uh, let's take a deep breath leading up to two to that mo that moment a, a year ago. And it is kind of wild to think it was about a year ago that we were uh, alerted, if, if not shortly before that, but really the seriousness of what the pandemic was going to be all about. Uh, started to sink in. My my, more or less my last day on the Stanford campus was about the, this. Yeah, it was about exactly uh, a year ago next week, and I've only been back a couple of times. You know, heavily chaperoned to go to my office to get some materials. It's pretty wild to think about space. Think of the spaces, and when you you know when I walked back into that campus and Stanford's everybody, please come visit when we can travel again. It is. Have you had a chance, Mateus? Have you been there? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty spectacular, just like your campus. And Lauren, you said you were from the area, right? I'm originally from Oregon, but I've got family in the area and I know it well. It's very beloved. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm talking about Stanford and in, in, in specifically because it has that, uh, there's that story, you know, it was, it was created by Italian artisans and in, in the, <laughs> I love it. When, when I say long ago, 130 years ago, but then I look at the <laughs> when your university was founded <laughs> at Heidelberg. It's a, <laughs> it's a different order of magnitude. But anyway, it was created by Italian uh, Italian artisans brought over by this family, the Stanford's. And, and so it's spectacular. And I was walking around it on my way to the office to get some materials. And I miss it, of course, because I spent so much time there the 24 years previous to that. I mean, you know, more there than probably any other space on the planet. All right, so that's just my story to set up that spaces are important and the run up to a year ago, and this is my point, I guess, is what will the pan what will be the long term, the long tail, which I think will be a long tail with this pandemic, what will it mean to this discussion we're having right now? Because there was a lot of investment, a lot of interest in creating these makers. You know, there were some of them, if it was 
maker spaces if it had something to do with a physical kind of stuff, especially with the rise of 3D printing and, and they, they just popped up everywhere. And I, you heard at the beginning with that um, way kind introduction, I'm a, it's a funny thing to say, I'm a visiting professor this year at Duke University and the University of North Carolina in the state of North Carolina. I, I was down there before the pandemic popping in on occasion and they took me over to the new dorm, this big dorm that had its own makerspace built in the dorm. Not, you know, not over in the mechanical engineering department or the business school or the whatever. It, it had, it was putting makerspaces embedded in this large high rise dorm because the University of North Carolina is a public school. So it's pretty big. You know, it's probably 30 or 40,000 like you. Duke is much more like a Stanford size. But anyway, everywhere I turned, these spaces were popping up because heretofore, maybe somebody would have a little room here and there for the entrepreneurial students to, to meet up. But it was becoming a, um, a priority for these universities to create these community gathering places for students to get together and collaborate on something. So it it, whether it was physical uh, you know, maker spaces or digital. So here we are with this pandemic. And I just wonder, we've all shown that we can do a lot of things remotely. So what, what will this have on this obsession that the universities had leading up to uh, a year ago about creating these in a physical way? I don't know, honestly. I, I mean, we'll see. Yeah, but uh, isn't it? I mean, if you think about, I mean, what, for example, what what we are missing is is uh, we have these conferences now online. Of course, it's great. You don't need to travel. For example, <laughs> you miss the opportunity to be in Heidelberg. I, I'm afraid. But anyways, uh, it's for you. It was easy now to participate in this discussion because you just had to turn on your Zoom. That's great. You don't have jet lag and all these kind of things. But at the same time, of course, we don't have these meetings at the coffee break. We don't uh, yeah. we don't have these funny encounters which have no agenda. At the moment, everything is agenda driven. We don't have these funny encounters where suddenly somebody tells you something totally different from what you thought about. Uh, and then suddenly uh, you have this inspiration. Oh, wow, that could be, that's interesting. Tell me more. So these kind of encounters, I think uh, you need to establish. And I wonder how you can do that. You, 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 you asked the question, how can you do that under these virtual times? I haven't seen a good solution so far for that. I have been to these avatar conferences <laughs> that was fun for my kids because they could then use these funny avatars to do crazy things with these avatars but for for really exchanging ideas i don't know whether that was the best uh, the best thing um so for this kind of idea of innovation fostering innovation um we need to get i mean i'm deeply convinced that we need to get people together with different backgrounds that's what we have yeah. at the university that's what our strength is I just been in a search committee for uh, robotics. It was amazing that all these guys they work together, uh, neuro neurologists with uh, te technical, with engineering people, together with mathematicians, physicists, uh, uh, name it. Even uh, even people from uh, humanities being participating in that because there's ethical issues and all these things involved. So they form these these uh, interdisciplinary teams. Uh, they have somehow their spaces. Uh, that's probably yes. their robot labs. Uh, where they can have fun together with these uh, funny, uh, funny beasts. Um, so somehow we need more of this. That's what I think. Uh, but uh, now being more also in administration, I wonder again, should I really put this as one of the big efforts and say, okay, we are going to organize that now. As you said, suddenly everybody has their own makerspace and then you wonder what to do with this makerspace. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess the, the, your, your, then your opportunity is to create incentives because it's always about incentives. So it, it, I believe the platforms are there, uh, whether there's this physical spaces that a lot of universities have created for collaborating across schools. And then there's the digital experience that we've all been just forced to try to leverage for the last year and will for a while, because you know it's gonna take, again, there's gonna be a long tail. I don't think things will be normal again for a while. So we have that, but those are platforms. I mean, those are mechanisms, but it, it's always about incentives <laughs> at the end of the day about how to get uh, people to collaborate. I mean, one here, here's a, 
Here's the good news. And again, it's more intellectual spaces than um, physical, if, that, if that's okay to buy for, you know, uh, to digress on this. Um, I'm missing a, a committee I'm on that, to do this. I, I had to miss a, our regular meeting of the president's initiative, not the president of the United States, but the president of Stanford's initiative on ethics, society, and technology. This is a brand new initiative. And I'm just wondering if there's a similar thing going on in Heidelberg. And it's, this all came about by our, we got we a new president about three, four years ago who said, I want to create a group, something reporting to him directly, just like the hospitals do, or you know, it, it, the president is the chancellor, as you know, in our system. Uh, is the sort of CEO of the whole university, including everything. So, but he said, I want at my, on my staff, I want a group of faculty who are obsessed with ethics, society, and technology. Because, you know, innovating without ethics at the core of it is, is dangerous. As we've seen, you know, we, we don't have to list off all the, the, malfeasance and misbehaving and consequences that we've noticed, especially the last 10 years. All right, so I, I was really lucky to be put on the design team for that and I ended up on the, the actual governance board. So we meet um, every month and I, I've learned pretty much about everything going on on campus having to do with the intersection of those three words, ethics, society, and technology. I really do. And I've I'm, I'm been really, even in this time, without having the benefit of being able to collide the way you're talking about. So I'm optimistic that when we're able to do that, it'll be even better. I'm noticing a real shift. Here's, here's a specific example. Stanford goes out and raises a billion US dollars to start the, a, a center on AI, artificial intelligence. A billion. I think MIT raised a billion. So of course, we raised a billion. <laughs> you know, I'm kidding about that. I know we're on YouTube. I'm kidding. So it, anyway, it, AI is a big, important topic, and it's worth raising a billion dollars. And so, um, but here's the good. Here's what makes me optimistic: the people running that, one of whom is the former provost. Uh, Echemendi, along with Fei Fei, uh, who is this incredible AI expert, they are the leaders of this new center for human, and they even named it Human Centered AI. So the, the institute is called, you know, HAI. They put the word human centered at the beginning. And when I see their call for proposals as they start to ramp up this billion dollar institute, it is, concludes lots of language about ethics and values. And, and constant, you know, uh, responsible technology, you know, it, it, um, it includes lots of language about, uh, well, okay, let's think about innovation and entrepreneurship from the get go, not, you know, not later. So I mean, first step is let's make sure in, in, it's got ethics involved. And, you know, of course, that was the case always in health systems. I mean, that's for decades or in nuclear engineering, that was always the case in nuclear engineering, but it was never, quite the case when it comes to digital technologies, frankly. And, and so it's really great to see that kind of thought going on right away. And I did slip in, I do see that they think right away about um, tech transfer from the get go of this institute, not just as an afterthought. So that, that makes me happy. And that's kind of a space, you know, that, this has happened even in the midst of a pandemic where we couldn't have those kind of collisions you're talking about. Oh, and by the way, Etchemendi is the, the co-director, the former provost, is a professor of philosophy. And then Fei Fei is the, this world-renowned techni you know, te technical person, engineer, computer scientist on. So the, the two people running the place, one philosopher, one computer scientist, that's another signal. Yeah, yeah, we are we are currently also we are running this this we are currently setting up a big program that has to do with data in general. I mean, not only AI data in general, which also requires uh, requires this multi-perspective view on it. Uh, not only ethics, as you said, philosophy, legal issues, what uh, name it, 
Uh, we have a wonderful institution here at uh, Heidelberg University, and that is the so-called Masilius College. Masilius College. Masilius was the first founder of, of Heidelberg Universities, of you know, Heidelberg University, and um, so this is a is is now a, a great. It's a, like an institute for advanced sciences, which brings together people from all these different backgrounds that then uh, set us into the position to look at these these interesting questions from from many perspectives. Yeah? And uh, that's how you make progress. Uh, the question is whether this is going to this is certainly going to create innovation and then the next thing will be how can you make uh, how can you make business out of such insights that will be the next important step I, but my observation after 25 years of hanging around a university at you know this type of university which is very similar to heidelberg as far as its position and its uh, breadth um, is these things are being thought of up front rather than as afterthoughts. And they're, and they're, and they're even part of the RFPs, you know, the request for proposals that, that are sent out to give grants. So I, I like that, I like seeing that because then uh, maybe that's a, that's a way to avoid some of the train wrecks or, you know, that we've seen with uh, some technologies that came out of, um, you know, came out of the past. Lauren, anything else on your mind? <laughs> uh, I'd actually uh, like to pose a question to you, Matthias. As a quantum physicist, your work is obviously at the cutting edge of innovation. So how has your study of quantum physics informed your decision-making processes in your current position as vice rector of innovation and transfer? Yeah, that, that's, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, um, I, of course, I'm also wondering myself all the time, how much does your, let's say, your profession or the things that you love, how much do they also influence your thinking? And um, certainly, I, one of the things that I realized with the years is that the diving deep into a subject also very strongly influences your intuition. And uh, I think uh, as... Uh, as a quantum physicist, of course, I think you get a good intuition about what noise is. Uh, of course, we love noise as, as quantum physicists. Everything starts with noise. Uh, noise is everything. Uh, and it creates great structures, but everything has to start with noise. Uh, in the best case, it's quantum noise. So uh, that is probably one of the things that's shaping my intuition in the sense that we need to allow for uh, things just happening to a certain extent. Of course, there needs to be a certain direction eventually being given uh, once a while. But uh, um, yeah, uh, this is uh, allowing for different things just to go around and just hope that there might be some emergent effects that make it become exponential growth eventually, I think is important. It's very hard to, dis to, to, to explain that to politicians because uh, uh, this is something where, it, where sometimes you can't predict, you have to allow for emergence to take place and, and sometimes don't even know in which direction it goes. Uh, that's what we sometimes call zeitgeist in this in, 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 in the humanities or in literature. But uh, it, it usually goes into good directions if there's uh, the right amount of people with the right intentions uh, 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 creating noise. So that is certainly one of the things that is that I took with me from 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 my from my from my profession, if you like. Another thing is that um, that if you if you want to find we, we, that's what we started with if you want to find good answers to complex questions and we have lots of these complex uh, problems at the moment uh, around uh, climate change you named it corona epidemics no matter uh, you also need to think in networks in strongly correlated systems so there is no linear solutions to complex, highly correlated problems. Therefore, what you also have to set up is, is, is networks. And it's clear that networks are much more resilient and also much more productive uh, than having linear chains. So mm -hmm. if, you, if it comes to innovation, uh, I think it's important to connect these different perspectives, connect different people, connect different diversity to connect different backgrounds, no matter. Um, 
so to connect them and in this moment you will see that there is something uh, being developing that can adjust to uh, what is actually needed so uh, it, to a certain extent these kind of uh, insights or intuitions mm -hmm. they partially also influence um, the the approaches that I'm taking but most of the time I have to say I mean I'm in this position now since a year uh, most of the time I'm trying to listen. Uh, I'm trying to figure out and tr I'm trying to go around here and figure out where is the, where is, where is the, where's the interesting questions? Where is the incentive? Uh, where's people are, where are people already doing something great? Uh, to this extent, I'm trying to also now form this kind of network, bringing people together, connecting them. So, um, yeah, there's another, maybe, maybe I should say there's another thing that I probably took with me from from this uh, from this let's say more uh, from this uh, from from my from my scientific interest is that if there's no fundamental law speaking against something it's possible mm -hmm. yeah. so visions are very very strong that's what I learned also from my mentors um, if there's no fundamental law speaking against something it's it's possible <laughs> so then and that's uh, what you said Tom uh, if there's big problems, look for big solutions. Um, yeah, I really like that phrase. Uh, I, it's going to be my takeaway from this hour amongst many. I'm so, again, humbled and honored to have this time with you and all the folks, in, and I'm, I'm sure feel the same way uh, watching on YouTube. But I'm looking for a different word than disruptive. That's been, mm. That was one of the catch words of the last 10 years in, you know, when talking about innovation and entrepreneurship and that we've seen, I mean, just look at the pressure on democracies, thanks to uh, the unintended consequences of uh, platforms like, and networks, you can call them, um, like Facebook. So I like that your positive approach to saying networks are good because they're resilient and so there's it, it isn't so much about innovators always being so obsessed about being disruptive meaning somebody's got to lose in order for their novel idea to 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 gain i i guess you know call me too idealistic even at my old age you know but so what it's fun to try to be i think we all could use a dose of being a little idealistic that I hope you're right the way you know the way you're describing it. and i like it as opposed to hey hey 20 year old go disrupt something <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean you know be I, i'm not trying to i mean i went to uc berkeley which you know is it's famous for its activism there's you still be an activist but it doesn't have to start with uh, it, it is making some people suffer good people otherwise suffer or good, you know, good systems suffer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a bit of the, at least in my world of tech entrepreneurship, that was a bit of the rallying cry the last 20 years that has shown to really have unfortunate downsides. Tom, I'd like to jump in here. You, can you both hear me? Yes, Lauren. Fabulous, Long just clear. double checking. Yeah. Uh, you led right into my last question, which is perfect timing because we're coming up here in the last few minutes before we jump into the Q&A. And the last question I'd like to hear from both of you, answers I'd like to hear from both of you, is what would you like to see happen in the next 10 years in the field of innovation and transfer? Professor? Oh, Tom, you're the professor, so uh, you're the professional <laughs> <laughs> for these kind of questions. Oh, I want to, but I, I'm, I want to think. I, I feel like we're on one of those game shows, and I did not hit the button. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to hit the button. Uh, I mean, I, I, all right, I'll go. I mean, it, it's. I, I almost hope I, that's what I've said in, in my rambles the last hour. What I hope to see is that innovation and entrepreneurship education is is available to every college student. I mean, just think about it. The next 10 years, and one thing we have as a, as a planet in our favor is we have some great universities. I mean, Heidelberg, Stanford, 
and so many others. Some of them go back 130 years, like mine. Some of them go back centuries, like uh, Mateus. Wow, I mean, and they are still great. They, they, really ha they really are, and they, they've withstood all kinds of things. There's even some new type uh, colleges and universities that are popping up, which is fine. And now with this capability that we're all sort of, we, I think to a person, I know people miss being in the classroom, but there'll be also opportunities to learn just purely digitally. I mean, it, it's, there, there are high quality offerings that are just pure digital. So think about that. So we're gonna have a chance to educate more people in the next 10 years than probably combined up until now. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, I mean, given the population expansion too, what, we're, we're approaching 8 billion. So I, we have a shot to educate all of them, you know, or I mean, a good, a good portion of them. So I, I'm, I'm not a professor of education, but I just thought of it as, you know, thinking about your question. So I'd like to see that we are, we are emphasizing what we've been talking about, which is science and engineering still matter. I mean, the physical sciences and the, the, uh, the joy of being an engineer, which is my background, it, they still matter, but they're not, it's not sufficient. That, I think that's necessary uh, for success and you know, to, to improve the chances for uh, the planet to thrive and survive, or survive and thrive. But it's also, um, it, it, it's just, it's going there's just this opportunity for us to have a, and take advantage of the, of, of getting things out of the laboratory and into uh, benefiting society in a faster way than ever before. We, we don't want to, we don't want to inhibit the processes that, been, that the good professor was talking about, about, uh, I like that. I, mean, I also liked, what'd you call it? Uh, noise. Noise is not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. I've really, that's the other takeaway from today for me. It's not a bad thing. We want that. We want that chaos of curiosity driven research and the imagination flourishing and the creativity from that. But I'm sort of on the back end of that process, which is, okay, then it goes into an innovation, then it gets through entrepreneurship accelerated into society. That's also a process with networks, but a different kind of part of the funnel. So we can get these solutions into, uh, into you know, spread around the world to, to address these challenges. So. You know, I'm, I'm just saying the same thing I've said before, but I want to be here. I want to do this call 10 years from now and do a, a, an accounting of how well we've done with uh, programs like Heidelberg has or Stanford has, because if anything, the pandemic has woken us up. I mean, it, I, I hope so, that, that we can't just do business as usual when we get back to normal we have got to take it uh, the seize this moment to accelerate things and people like Mateus at Heidelberg and my colleagues at Stanford I have a lot of faith in this next generation to um, uh, to come up with great great solutions so I'm beginning to just ramble now but that's that's my hope for 10 years Yeah, I mean, what I love the statement of our former Chancellor Schmidt that said, "If you have visions, you better go see doctors." So, in this sense, it's always difficult to uh, to tell what you want to have for uh, for uh, for the next uh, ten years. I, one of the things I have to say is, I would love that um, there's so much talking about crisis these days, and in particular in Germany, everything is always Götterdämmerung. Uh, I would like to uh, that we change this view on on what's going on in the world. The world is the world is complex. The world is complicated. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, of course, there's uh, there's big challenges like we had now with the Corona crisis. But it would be important now, for example, to change. I just, just said this to my older kids. I said to them, uh, just think about the things that you can do because of this Corona epidemics and not think about the things you can't do because of this epidemics. For example, at the moment, you can study at a totally different place and still make your certificates at Heidelberg University. You can live 
you can live somewhere else, still get the certificate from, from Heidelberg University if you, if you like that. Uh, I'm not saying that I want to have this <laughs> for the entire time, but it's just changing angles and seeing uh, the challenges that this world uh, is creating for us to see them as also as, as, uh, as opportunities to become innovators and to create something, uh, something important. The other thing is if you talk about innovation and, and, and transfer in particular um, here also uh, at Heidelberg University, it, it would be great if this just became something that is now be, be, became one of the important pillars of our of our work of our uh, of what we are doing, and that it becomes something that is just 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 happens. Uh, we we stuff support it, but we don't need to uh, even have a prorector uh, at this moment uh, because it's just happening. Maybe that would be the greatest thing for me. For those closing thoughts, thank you for this entire hour. It has been absolutely illuminating. I feel like I can fill my entire notebook up just from this one discussion between the two of you. So I thank you heartily on behalf of everyone here at the DAI and all of our audience members, I'm sure. Absolutely thrilled to hear your thoughts. Now, are you gentlemen ready to be peppered with a handful more questions for the next 20 <laughs> minutes from our yes, audience? Yes, please, please, please. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to start uh, with this one. Considering technology and ethics, physics and medicine have a longer history of ethical hazard, so perhaps they have mature schemas for handling ethics. What can digital tech learn from them? Wow, mm. that's just, that's a beautiful question. Um, and I've been trying to answer it now for three years since I've been, I, I, was awakened by this uh, train wreck known as Theranos. You remember this company mm -hmm. three, four years ago mm -hmm. that was going to do blood tests by just a, or all kinds of tests, you know, from just a little prick of the finger. And it became a worldwide phenomenon of, um, of its demise, you know, as a de because of its demise. Well, that entrepreneur used to come to my office hours as a first year student at Stanford and uh, asked me for contacts and review her, uh, you know, slides, <laughs> things like that. And it made me just think, wow, you know, where, what happened? I mean, mm. to this particular human being. And so then it got stranger month by month because on the heels of that was uh, Uber's troubles about three, four years ago. And shortly after that, there was another uh, big blow up, the WeWork. Um, company with uh, Adam Newman. And so I was thinking, where, what, why is there no attention to ethics? Now, I want to be very careful here. I am not an ethicist. I, I'm, I've studied more philosophy the last three years <laughs> since, the, since my undergraduate years. <laughs> which has been great to rediscover the classics, but it still doesn't make me um, a ethicist. I've, I've partnered with some, which is wonderful. And I learned from them about the, the, these issues that go back centuries. And so it is fascinating that uh, life, the life sciences have had it as part of um, in, in integrated, and it is today, you know, with, this is not just new with the invention of CRISPR, which is the latest, you know, big paradigm shift in life sciences. And CRISPR was put together and it's great to see a University of California, Berkeley professor, Jennifer get such notoriety for that uh, technology. So I'm, I'm sort of pleased that we have the analog. We in digital tech, which is my own background, uh, in, in, industry-wise. And so I've been in the field for, or, or been in the industry long, uh, long before I was a professor. Um, 
we just did not think too much about these issues. And it, and it really got away from us because when digital tech was pretty much just a segment of society, the consequences were uh, modest. I mean, I helped start an antivirus company, a software company, one of the very first ones in the 1980s. And that was before cybersecurity and all that kind of stuff because the industry was just relatively small. There were only a few, you know, uh, personal computers, uh, nothing like, you know, the billions of phones we carry around now. Um, so it was uh, really fascinating to me to think, wh why did it, ne why, how did this happen and get to, to where we are now? And rather than just wallowing in history, this is how can we change that? So I, our contribution is that anybody teaching innovation and entrepreneurship, which we have significant numbers of them at Stanford and it's great to learn at Heidelberg, it is up to uh, us, I mean, the two of us on this call to make sure that values, principles, and uh, ethics, if you want to call that, applied ethics, I think is a better way to say it, supplied ethics, are going to be part of our Op, uh, operations. I mean, from top to bottom, I mean, ac across the board, I mean, completely. So whether it's the classroom or whether it's the actual research going on, it, it, especially in digital tech, um, it needs to match what had been developed for so many years in, in, other, um, in other fields. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a problem, but again, it's really easy, not easy to fix, it can be fixed by emphasizing values and principles as much as emphasizing the stuff that we did do as we were teaching innovation entrepreneurship. Well, you heard me talk about, um, you know, I'm not, I don't get excited about this stuff, by the way. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 going, I'm, all, I'm going crazy again. So I'm, I'm going to wrap it here. But, but instead of talking about disruption, you know, it's, it's talking, of, coming up with new terminology. That's why I said I learned so much from, talking about that, uh, talking to hear about what Mateus had to say. So that's the kind of language we need to emphasize when we're, it, it, rather than uh, go out and move fast and break things. Remember that was the motto of Facebook. And they did, they almost broke democracy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, so by moving so fast and, and when I interview or talk to the leaders of Facebook 10 years ago, they say, well, you know, we really didn't think about consequences. We were too busy just trying to beat the competition and survive another day. So entrepreneurs are particularly, technology entrepreneurs are particularly vulnerable to the temptations of ignoring consequences or maybe bending the truth a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, just to jump. So those are the things we're emphasizing now in our curriculum. And I know shame on us for not emphasizing that earlier but I can guarantee you the, the type of innovation entrepreneurship we're teaching now it includes a heavy emphasis on values and principles. So mm -hmm. with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to my partner here. Hard, hard to add something, but there, there's maybe one you, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, physics and, and, health and, and uh, medicine. Um, that was something, of course, uh, that I, I thought a lot about in particular or no, it started when I was even at school I think these, these ideas that suddenly uh, you, nobody cared about physics and suddenly there was this uh, nuclear fission and and, and and there was this idea there was this possibility of building this bomb and, and how what it made to people I think one of the at least that's one of the things that I came up with is, is of course, if you have technological progress and you want to make it happen fast, you need to uh, surround yourself with people that are thinking in the same lines as yourself, because then you can really push something very fast forward. But there's also the risk then at this moment that you are somehow caught in what I would call a mind bubble. So a bubble of people that all have the same mindset as, as you have. And I guess that is probably one of the biggest dangers that you have in fast developing technologies that uh, at a given moment, uh, the, the main protagonists are surrounding themselves only by people that are thinking in the same directions than they do. Uh, and uh, at this moment, you create uh, systems that are, um, that are closed. So if there's ways to, to avoid this, I don't know 
how and what is the best approach, but it would certainly be, if you th think about ethical consequences, at a very early stage of any kind of important technological development, you have to make sure that there is different, there's still possibilities of different ideas and different um, approaches influencing and uh, and uh, and um, making contributions to this development. Here we are back in the difference between linear thinking and, and uh, thinking in nonlinear terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for that. The next question I have here from our audience is a very practical question by my standards. How can students be integrated in interdisciplinary approaches at university and how can they be integrated into the quote-unquote real research? You, you integrate it into the real research. That is the that was the second part of the question, and the other one was in in, in uh, interdisciplinary processes. Correct. I, I, in the research, I think um, that is I I can just I mean from all the places that I know, uh, Stanford and the American places that I've been, all over the world places that I've been, there's just knock on the doors. The people yeah. will open. The, the doors will be either open. Usually, my doors are always open, and I <laughs> all great places I've been, doors are always open. You can mm -hmm. just enter. Uh, just don't be afraid. I mean, professors love to be, in, be asked questions. They love students to discuss too and to, to share knowledge and to be part of their groups. I've never seen a counterexample to that, I, I, I have to say. I mean, it's, it's it, just do it. Uh, I don't know what, in Germany, of course, we sometimes have these hierarchical uh, ideas and systems, but um, don't care about it, just do it. Yeah, I, I've been fascinated by this program I believe we call it university, no, no, sorry, let me start over. Undergraduate Research Opportunities, U-R-O. And that is funding by the deans or the provost, in other words, the leadership level, to employ as research assistants um, students in their uh, back, you know, bachelor years, right? You know, the, their first yeah. four years. And that works really well. And, yeah. uh, it, it, and I've just been, those students, when I see them a little later, you know, I'm, they tell me, I'm, I'm never, I'm never put it, but every single student that ever participated in one of those and it was, came up in conversation has told me um, how much it meant for them to be in the labs. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe that universities, at least the ones I know of, have adopted that model and that is a relatively new phenomenon over the last 20 years. I believe there's the knock on the door, but now there's actual funding that makes it, you know, again, incentives. It makes it really easy for a research lab director to say, great, I get, not only do I get fresh thinking by a 20 year old, if you will, you know, uh, but I, I, I get it with no cost. <laughs> mm -hmm. The, the inter, oh, yeah. interdisciplinary issue is a, is a more complicated one. Yeah. Uh, then we are coming back to my question about spaces or this, this question on how do we, and I don't mean just physical space, of course it might be also physical spaces, but how do we create also, let's say, mental spaces within the curriculum uh, that yeah. are um, giving, giving space in this kind, also space to, to just dive into different topics. Um, in Germany, we have um, the system has changed over the years now that uh, uh, with the introduction of uh, what we call credit points, um, these credit points became some kind of reality that I totally underestimated. Um, when I was studying, we also had some certain obligations, but I, I, I think nobody really cared until the last year that you were suddenly had to re realize, okay, what do, I, what do I need to do to finalize or to finish my studies? Today now everything is much more structured by these credit points, but nevertheless, I think it's a, at the moment, I, at least in Germany, I encounter a peer group phenomena that all the groups of students, they think they need to follow this system uh, really uh, strictly uh, word by word. So use, I can just say, I mean, the university is a great place, just go to different lectures, go to different places, discuss with the people. Um, if it gets credit points, great. If not, uh, also fine. Of course, that is difficult to do if you need to finance your studies by somewhere or the other. Um, but from a, from let's say, from a leadership perspective of the university, um, we have to think about how we can create, in, in the broadest sense, uh, spaces for that. Uh, I have no yeah, simple. I, I have no simple. If you have a great idea, uh, let me know. 
from? Well, one one thing. Well, every afternoon, you know, in, in normal times, at around four p.m. or five p.m., there are seminars, and in making sure those seminars taught by the various schools around the campus are open to you know anyone just for to walk-ins you know not just available for say one unit of credit but to just walk-ins a student that is a great way to stimulate that and our uh, earlier you heard about something called eCorner which is really just a website in, in a collection it's also available on YouTube of just hundreds of video clips of innovators and entrepreneurs over the last 20 years and we continue to populate it with uh, 30 or so talks a year. That live studio audience, if you will, is about 300 people. And we go out of our way to encourage humanity students, uh, social science students to join with physical science and engineering students to watch those live. So we've created this uh, sort of event every Wednesday at four o'clock. And then we, we tape it, of course, then to put on that site to, to share with the world. Um, and so we have two bit that does that provides a benefit. We're really proud that the demographic of that room is uh, across. The, here's the reason why, and I, if, well, I may have 90 seconds. I'll, I'll never forget the speech by Steve Jobs about when he was introducing the iPhone or the iPad. I can't remember. And it was this traffic sign of you know, he was ill, but he was still healthy enough to be Steve Jobs. This is maybe 15 years ago. Um, and it, the traffic sign was uh, humanities and technology. You know, one road was humanities, the other road was technology. And he says, Apple lives at that intersection. <laughs> and, and, and I just I loved that quote. Mm -hmm. Apple lives at that intersection. And, and you know, Really, who lives at the intersection is us, is Heidelberg and, and Stanford. So how do we op, how do we take advantage of that? We've been living at an intersection for uh, ever, and so too many times, things like tech transfer or innovation, entrepreneurship, all these things we've been talking about has been seen as oh, that's the scientists or the business people or the engineers. It's not really about the humanities, and of course, it, it really it is our responsibility to make that intersection uh, uh, even stronger. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you both. Okay, I've got one last question. I believe we've got just time for one more. And I'm going to finagle it a little bit differently so it's applicable to both of you. And the question is, if you could create your own course for future ethical leaders, what would your ideal course look like? <laughs> Design a curriculum here, Professor. In 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Ethically, was ethical uh, for ethical uh, leaders or what? Ethical was it? leaders, yeah. yes. Yeah. Ethical yeah. leaders. Uh, it's again a question. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, that would mean uh, that I would actually <laughs> know what an ethical leader is. Uh, that would be the first uh, uh, presumption. But uh, again, I would I would love to have a course where at each lecture, but that's probably a bit tough. You would learn something about a different discipline and topic, and just the thinking of this topic. Not more, not like details on what this is about, but how do people think in this? How do people think in this discipline? How do they how do they solve problems? How mm -hmm. do they address problems? And this uh, for each different discipline. One and a half hours, 90 minutes. How do you solve a problem? Tell me yeah. a problem and how do you solve it? Mm -hmm. Let me build on that. I, I like that. I, I'm, I'm going to borrow his idea. <laughs> I think that's the, he, everything he said. Uh, how, but also this, how about as, this is a start, is to say, hey, folks, if, if you know, professors always like two by two matrices or graphs or <laughs> so i'm going to grab one <laughs> how about this when 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 a decision is uh, right when it's legal or not you know meaning is this decision legal or not legal okay 
That's one dimension. And the other one is, but is it right mm. or wrong? So when it's not legal and not right, that's the easy ones. <laughs> okay, easy. A word that's both legal and the right thing to do, that's really easy. It's when one of those are, are, are uh, at, at play, you know, it's the right thing to do, but it's not terribly, it's not exactly legal or it's, uh, it's, you know, the, it's legal, but uh, you, know, you know what I mean? It, it, when it's one of the two overlaps, that's, uh, that's when leaders uh, need to have some sort of set of personal principles or maybe organizational principles if it's, uh, if it, you know, it's part of a, an enterprise. That's when uh, developing those ahead of time, not on, not on the very moment that the, the decision's being made, because everything's moving so fast now, especially in science and technology, it's, it's not good enough to wait to that moment to start figuring out what your principles are. That's what, that would be the, so let's go practice that. Let's go look at, the, take what he was talking about and just say, let's, let's not take the easy ones, you know, yes or no, but let's take the ones where there's, and really let's take some ones where there's competing values, like drones, you know, mm -hmm. for warfare. I mean, it, drones are, are, are great because nobody on your side gets hurt, but it could also d have civilian casualties. I mean, so, you know, there's that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. Tricky business, not an easy question. Great question. Excellent question. Thank you so much to our audience members for coming up with these plethora of fabulous questions. Unfortunately, there are heaps that we didn't get an opportunity to get to, but we look forward to having both of you gentlemen join us again sometime in the future, and hopefully we'll be able to go over those questions. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Lauren. And thank uh, you, Professor. looking forward thank to visit you, Heidelberg. I want to come visit Heidelberg in the region next year. Yes, we do. We look forward to having you. All right, everybody at home, thank you so much for watching. This was a fabulous event. We thank you all for coming. Again, for more information, visit dai-heidelberg.de or take a look at our YouTube channel. Everybody, good night and take care.